One of the things we learn when we're learning Hakomi and that we teach in our trainings, we're coaching the therapist or practitioner in, is, is how much to wait and allow the client to do the work that they're doing. Remember that Hakomi is a collaboration. It's not the therapist doing something to the client. The, the client and the therapist are in a journey together and a lot of times what happens, happens in silence. The therapist needs to know when the client seems to be internalizing something or working on something that's productive, not just going back and wallowing into some old pattern, but actually making connections perhaps or remembering something. It's the times that we wait that something can show up for the client that's an important part of what wants to happen next. When we are comfortable with silence and tracking the client and giving them space, uh, sometimes a memory shows up, sometimes emotion shows up, and sometimes a state of mind changes. Uh, the child might show up, for example. And if we are busy, uh, actually talking or even doing experiments too much of the time, it doesn't allow the space for those more hidden and more subtle aspects that are outside of consciousness but just waiting, just waiting for the, the space and the quietness and the opportunity to show up. So getting comfortable with knowing when not to do anything, when to wait, when to just watch, when to hold the space, and then watching for the signal that it's time to intervene, it's time to offer something, even a contact statement or some movement through an experiment of, of taking the process to the next step. This is part of the art of Hakomi. When we're working with somebody, and particularly holding the space where we can just track for each moment-to-moment -moment change, what shows up next, sometimes the emotion that shows up is just a hint. Sometimes we will actually see the visible signs of an emotion before the person is even aware that they're feeling it. And there's some brain research that shows that this indeed is what happens that the sign of the emotion may show on the face before the person actually is conscious of it. So we're watching for the hints of emotion and of course the obvious emotion that shows up. Emotion has information. Emotion has information about what's important. It might have information about a memory. It, ha it might have information about the way somebody uh, makes meaning of something. So the belief may come through as the person expresses the emotion. Ron was always teaching that when the person became emotional, the, the practitioner needs to wait. Maybe put a hand on them for comfort if that's appropriate or have an assistant do that. But when the emotion shows up, other than possibly a contact statement, we wait. We wait because we know that the emotion has with it the connections to the beliefs, to the memory, to the missing experience, that if we wait, those will show up all by themselves. So there's, there's nothing, we don't need big emotion in Hakomi. Even a little hint of emotion, if we wait and give it space, has the information that is important. If it's big emotion, it might require simply comfort. But a little bit of emotion, if we make the space for it, might lead us to exactly what's needed. In Hakomi, we aren't necessarily looking for memories. We're realizing that the person comes to us as an embodied expression of their whole history. And whether they can remember anything or not is not necessary to work with them. We're working with present time and with the way 
in present time they're organizing experience and we know it's connected to their history and their past experience definitely and the way the brain is predicting the same thing to happen over again and the strategies they have but memory often shows up or what seems to be a memory and realizing that this is present centered it doesn't preclude the importance of a memory when it shows up. But I'm very clear with people that we're not concerned about the accuracy of the memory in terms of what happened or didn't happen. We can't count on it. Memory is not reliable as a report of what actually happened in the past. But it is reliable in revealing beliefs and core material and the ways that we make meaning of things and organize experience in present time. So for that reason, we, we welcome a memory. And when someone is remembering, this is a present experience. We can contact that in present time. Instead of going back into the story of the past, we can contact, so you're remembering. Remembering is a present time experience. And in remembering, we'll see a shift in demeanor. We'll see the embodiment change. We'll see the state of mind change. If we wait, as the person is remembering, they will reveal, either in a nonverbal way or often in words, something about the way they make meaning, something about the beliefs that came out of whatever caused them to be remembering in this way. And we'll also realize some of the strategies and some of the habits that come with that memory. Sometimes emotion comes with the memory. And this is when I tell people that emotion sometimes shows up just to underline what's important. And the quality of the emotion sheds a little light on, again, the beliefs, and the habits that go into organizing experience and particularly emotions and emotional memories show the way to the missing experience. They're not so important in terms of the past. They do reconnect with the past and reveal something about the past, but what they're important to us for in Hakomi is opening the door to what is the missing experience what's needed now that if something changes about the beliefs and habits and the new possibilities are apparent, some kind of new experience of nourishment becomes possible. What we see often in this culture at least in our Hakomi work is the underlying wound of shame, of people not feeling okay or lovable just as they are. And I remember working in an addiction center years ago, mainly with substance abusers, and we showed a film of John Bradshaw, who was well known in the 12-step movement, and then recovering alcoholic himself. And it was a movie about shame, and toxic shame and shame and guilt and I remember him saying that guilt says I made a mistake shame says I am a mistake guilt says I did something wrong shame says there's something wrong with me this is the underlying wound of most of the people that will show up for Hakomi therapy or even for any of us in, in, in life, the situations that are painful for us, probably if we go down to the deepest layer of our reaction, there's something about feeling wrong, feeling like there's something wrong with us. And so it's very, very powerful to have the healing happen in a group setting. It's wonderful in our Hakomi trainings that the group that comes together to learn Hakomi ostensibly begins to do their own healing as we're working on our personhood as the most important ingredient and what we have to offer is our presence. And as we do our own healing, there's something about having a group support us 
in that healing process that's immensely powerful. And I personally feel like Hakomi works a hundred times better in a group setting than one-to-one. -one. And that therapy generally needs to happen in a group, or at least if it's one-to-one -one therapy that the person has a group to go to where they can feel accepted. This is the ultimate healing. Ron actually, Ron Kurtz, who developed Hakomi, taught it mainly and practiced it mainly in a group setting. He was always working in a group. And when he was asked to do one-to-one -one Hakomi, he would invite the client to bring along a friend as an assistant, or he would invite somebody to be there as an assistant. So there was always at least three of them, a small group, yes, but at least three people. So there's a witness to the process that happens. And I think this is another powerful way to enhance the therapy and the healing process when the bottom line issue is about lack of self-acceptance. So consider the possibility of working in a way that includes some group experience. When we're watching the client's state of mind change and getting information about where to go in a Hakomi session, we might see a shift, for example, to an emotional state. We might see uh, remembering, the person thinking about something. We can see a variety of different states. And as they show up, they lead the way. We follow where they want us to go in the Hakomi journey. And one of the states that might show up from time to time is what we call the child. The person can even look a little childlike or sound a little childlike, have a voice that's childlike. They may be recalling a memory from childhood and then we can watch and see does the demeanor change in a way that suggests that that child part, we could think of it as, is, is present. During the time that I worked with Ron in the mid-90s, when we were starting to teach together, I actually saw him change the way he worked with the child state, with a client. He used to do something that he called the magical stranger, and the person was actually in a regressed state. They were feeling as if they were a child. They seemed to be a child. They were remembering, but as if they were reliving the child's state. And in the early days, Ron would work with the client as if they were a child and talk to them as if they were a child. He studied uh, the book Trances People Live of Stephen Walensky's, and he practiced, of course, in group settings with many different people. And in one training that we were working with, I saw him work with the child state with a woman one year, Next year, almost the identical session, working with her in the child state. And then the third year, she went into the same place again, which happens because it's a hypnotic state, basically. It's a trance state. It's not present time. And he realized that he needed to work with her differently. And so he began, instead of talking to the person directly as if they were a child, he, he would refer to the child in the third person. So there's a child here. How, how old does she seem to be? Maybe I can talk to her, or maybe you can talk to her, he would say, referring to this child part. is so much more respectful, and it keeps the person, the client, here in present time, in who they are, without having them imagine uh, that they're a child again. And yet we can still work with this part that has needs from childhood. And we do it that way, just that way as if uh, we can refer to the child as if she's sitting here, as if she's also in the room. What, what does she need? How does she look? What, what does she need to hear? Um, does she need to hear it from me or from you? How about from both of us? Um, what if you imagine, I might say to the client, what if you imagine um, taking that child in your arms? 
and she might even, the client might even want to hold on to something and imagine that's her child part. And she, and we, all the time we're asking the client to report what's happening for the child as well as what's happening for her. Sometimes when I see that somebody has a child state very present and there's an emotion and often it's a hurt emotion. So there's some kind of sadness or hurt feeling that comes up. I want to really pay attention to how that emotional state changes very subtly but very noticeably from the hurt feeling of the child to compassion from the adult, the client, toward the child. This is a really important shift. I can actually see it in the client that she stops looking like a hurt child and she still has the emotion, but now the emotion is compassion. And this kind of sadness and hurt feeling can evolve and morph into compassion in any of us when nurtured that way. And when I see or even imagine that the client is beginning to feel compassion for herself and for this child part, I contact that, I invite her to stay with that, to follow it, to let words come or actions come. And this is a huge healing for the client and her child part. One of the things we need to remember when we're working with something like an emotion or with the child state is that this is not who the person is. This is a neurological shift. These are circuits in the brain that hold a particular way of remembering something or making meaning of something. And the child is not a real part of the person. It's a state of mind. And I remember working with somebody uh, a few years ago who had an experience in a workshop of changing her embodied way of moving around the room. And she reported to me that she was a little concerned because it felt very good m walking around the room that way, except that she lost touch with her inner child, as she called it, her inner child. She felt this inner child that she'd been healing and taking care of for so long wasn't there anymore. She was walking around the room and it was gone. And that made her concerned. So I told her a story that it reminded me of. This is a strange story. One time when I was organizing a yoga workshop, I had some helpers and some assistants and one woman was from England. She was from Liverpool. In fact, she grew up with some of the Beatles and had some great stories about them. But the story she told me that felt relevant was that uh, her mother and had a friend who lived in quite an old building, almost a tenement building. And the buildings were being torn down and the people were all being moved to a new building. So my friend's mother went to help her friend with the move and everything big was being taken away by other people but the friend was holding this this little box of something obviously very precious that she was, wanted to make sure made it safely from her old home to the new one and the mother asked her friend what what's in the box and she said why it's me cockies she had her cockroaches from her old building that she thought she needed to live with in a box that she was going to take to the new building. Well, it seemed like a strange analogy, but I asked this woman, my friend, if, you know, she could imagine living in a place without that wounded child. Maybe she was ready to live in a new world, in a new reality. When our healing happens, there are parts of ourselves that may be left behind. It's not a loss. It's what needs to happen for transformation and healing.